The special order components have arrived to continue this project, so we'll get started now. First thing I'm going to replace is that temporary fix with one and a half microfarads with this two microfarad capacitor, uh, not only because for a variety of reasons it's the correct value and it looks better and it's not two replacing one, but also because uh, they are pushing outward in order to fit and getting heated up by the tube over here and the tube over here over time. I have a good feeling that's also contributing uh, to the values skewing as the device heats up. Uh, this one will be able to sit flush against that phenolic material. I took the time to use the method to determine what the outer foil was on this. There is uh, a, quite a difference when I look at the oscilloscope in looking at the interference that's caused depending on which side ground is. And I can see that the outer foil is the one that's marked as IC on here. Although it's not inherent to this, it just happens to be this one has the label IC and that's gonna be the side pointed to ground. That cap is now proper fitted and flush mounted to the board uh, far away from the two tubes. Here's another view of that installation. My next business will be the removal of this clutch and replace it with a uh, single 390 so I could get back uh, all of my capacitors. They were there temporarily and I'm just gonna clean this up. So I've gotten all three out and now I will just replace it with one. We can now see a much cleaner installation as one capacitor has replaced the three bulky capacitors that were previously in there. Moving on to the next step. Next step will require opening this cover to expose the uh, old precision resistors that are under the uh, range switch. I've gone and labeled everything appropriately beforehand so I don't go and screw it up because you know that sort of thing will happen. To reduce the amount of heat exposed to the switch what we're going to do first is we're going to actually cut out the old resistor. I'm going to start with the 2 meg and then we're going to use the solder pump with the soldering iron to remove the residual solder and piece from the switch and then we're going to install the new one. With the wire exposed, bite down on a corner so it'll come down in two pieces when we heat it, just like that. The first piece just kind of fell off right there. That way we don't have to spend too much time with the iron on it. There we go, it comes out nice and clean. Minimum amount of heat on the connector. I run the new resistor through, bend the ends slightly, not too much, just a little, hold it in place, and then apply new solder to it. Snip off the uh, excess lead. Resistor is complete. Do all the rest. And there's two done. With the last of the first half done, I now take a measurement of the three resistors. And I see my 20 meg. My 2 meg. My meter read slightly low. and my 200K. So all three are looking about perfect. I got the other three to do now. As I work my way to the back, the bottom ones proved to be more difficult. Uh, I still believe that I could get this done without taking the unit apart. It's just gonna take longer to do. All of the precision resistors are now replaced and tested. This portion of the project is now complete. We'll be able to turn this back over and restart our calibration procedure. As I allow the unit to warm up, I start preparing for the calibration of the voltmeter again. I'm starting calibration over from the beginning. This white wire connects to one of the leads going to the back of the pilot lamp. And I want to reiterate what I discussed in a previous video. Uh, it seems a little unfortunate to me. However, uh, this being an RMS meter, uh, the voltage measurement as described here, uh, 
would would show uh, a value that would be read as a peak to peak voltage, a 6.3 volts, which it is in and around you know that expected value if you were to read across both terminals. Um, not an exact value. It's actually a, a 6.64 volts. This caused uh, some problems in the last video in setting up that calibration. Uh, my fluke uh, is close to, but not exactly, and an RMS meter. It gets you in the ballpark, but they have flukes that do true RMS. This is not one of them. However, uh, my hand tech back there does RMS, and I have validated that against other RMS meters that I have. So I know the hand tech is spot on. So what I'm going to do, and it does even recommend in the instructions, if a standard meter of known accuracy is available, it may be used to provide a more exact calibration. Yeah, I'm doing that. So what I'm going to do, uh, looking at my oscilloscope, I can see that the RMS voltage is 2.32. I'm going to start dropping the sensitivity down to 10 volts. I, I got nothing to work with there at 30. There's 10, and I can see that 10 is way off. I'm going to get it in the ballpark on 10 and make this adjustment here. Keep the screwdriver in position for the purpose of this video. And I'm going to bring it down to... There's 2.4, there's 2.3, and it should be just a, a hair above 2.3. And now I'm confident that it's not going to peg when I drop it into the 3 volt position. I'll now bring it to the 3 volt position and count them off here. I got 2.1, 2.2, 2 2.3. A little bit high, I could see in that resolution. So now I could fine tune it. Fine tune it right here. There we go. There's 2.32 right there. So I think I got it just as close as possible. So now I'll move it back to 10, just take a look, make sure everything's okay. Uh, the 10 position still looks good, it's around 2.3. And at this setting, it looks good, 2.3. So I'm going to say that the voltage or the voltmeter calibration is now finished. We'll move on with the next one. The next procedure will be the balance adjustment, and it'll be done just like before. Uh, I do, however, also expect this one to change because all of the resistors in the range switch have been changed out. Uh, maybe significant, maybe not significant, but obviously uh, you start changing out components in any device, you're going to test and recalibrate. I have set up the field tech at 2 kilohertz, 5 volts, 50 ohm termination um, with some coax going straight into the unit, and I'm going to go through the same uh procedure as last time except that now i will be able to do the 200 2000 portion of this event after i finish this one something that i was not able to do effectively last time i did make adjustments on this balance portion you know when i was first doing this in the previous video i'll admit that i was sort of working this balance knob for the lowest deflection and that's not what this is about. If you really read this, what it really wants you to do is make sure that the balance knob is as centered as possible, right? And then work with the tuning knob and the potentiometer to get the lowest deflection possible, not the lowest deflection possible with the balance knob. The whole purpose here is to have this balance left in the center. You could then come back with something like this later, you know, but this is what they're trying to do is get this in the middle, right? And that's what I did here. Now I have to go and do the other half of this step, which is on the opposite side. So I'm gonna go and do that now. On this side, the other side of the open air capacitor, I've done the adjustment as well, and there was considerable adjustment to be made. Uh, it's not one of the more pleasant calibrations to do on this unit, it's not very easy. I would recommend that you have some sort of uh, insulated uh, tweaking device like this or it is exceedingly difficult to do so but I've got it done so the second portion of this is completed which means that the hum balance is next I was surprised there was even a slight adjustment of the um, hum balancer so and and I say slight it was very slight but 
that's done. Uh, test and calibration is completed. The final testing for the unit will be done against the HP331 Alpha. The signals for both of them are teeing off of the field tech. It is the same signal coming into both units. First test shows the RMS voltage at about 944 below. And as we go up, we can see again that the voltage also sits at around 944 up top to show that we have the same input voltage and that both meters are calibrated to each other or that they're both calibrated in general. I want to point out that even though based on the results I'm about to give, we could see that there's uh, room for deflection, I could drop down to the 0.3 scale. I'm not going to only because the Heath kit only goes down to 1%. So I'm stopping the HP at 1% so we could have accurate results between the two units. And for this signal, the HP has come in at the lowest possible setting of 0.14% total harmonic distortion. The Heath kit came in an amazing 0.11%, which is 0.03% off from the HP331 Alpha. This is absolutely amazing. And I've spent a good deal of time trying to obtain the maximum dip uh, for both of these units. This is at 2 kilohertz. So I'm very happy with the results here. It is almost spot on. And considering that the original specification says that the uh, tolerance for the uh, Heath kit is already just 0.1, uh, this is well within the uh, tolerance to match the Hewlett Packard. And this is where the good news ended because when you start looking at tests that were done comparing the HP against the Heath kit, you start to see that looking at the full sweep between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz, that while the HP maintains an almost consistent uh, harmonic distortion reading, you can see that about at about a thousand or one kilohertz, the um, heat kit starts to become deaf and you see the uh, red line start to move its way down more and more. I couldn't figure out what was causing this and I had reached out to one of the uh, antique radio forums for guidance on this matter namely Dale and Steve, who, who simply stated that the uh, Heathkit IM-12 uh, would not have the bandwidth uh, to be able to measure the uh, field tech, the modern uh, function generator that I'm using in a way that the HP would have been able to. And I had used a uh, separate device for the subsequent testing as a result of their recommendation. I broke out the IG-72 which is a much older unit. And in looking at the IG-72, I was able to get a, an entirely different result that I was very happy with and continue on with the testing. However, I was concerned about this value that I was getting between 70 Hertz and 700 Hertz, as we see here in the diagram. I could also see that the unit does become uh, a bit deaf even during this measurement here uh, towards the uh, end of the scale as we approach the, the top of the band. I've decided to go through the uh, circuits of this unit to see if there is a fault somewhere that I've missed. Even though I have checked the um, different components, I've, I've gone over the power supply portion uh, rather well. I believe that to be okay. There are two more second sections here. One's the fundamental suppression circuit and the other one is the voltmeter circuit. And I'm gonna be concentrating here on, on this, the fundamental, fundamental suppression circuit. What I'm gonna do uh, quite simply is I'm gonna start here at this uh, 12BY7, this phase inverter, and I'm gonna uh, connect here to seven and one as the outputs of the phase inverter and see if that's okay. See if I got a good signal. I'm not gonna be using this as, as distortion analyzer. I'm just gonna be tracing a signal through and I'm gonna go back to the field tech to get a, uh, uh, just push a sine wave and, and see what's going on here. And if everything's okay, I'm going to proceed along and I'm going to uh, 
try and evaluate how best to go about doing this. But right now, let's just start with a known good halfway through that portion. So I have a two kilohertz signal going into the input of the unit, and I have uh, oscilloscope probes connected to pin seven in one of the phase inverter. And I'll, I'll just point out really quickly, uh, the circuit is set up as such that uh, the output is two to one. So one of the uh, output signals is going to be uh, twice as large as the other. Uh, that being said, interesting note right here, I am seeing a distortion on this waveform. It's worth investigating. I am seeing a distorted waveform where the input is a clean sine wave. So right here I have cause for concern. Before I do anything else, though, I do want to take a quick measurement to verify the 2 to 1 ratio. I'm seeing a peak to peak right now of 2 volts on this first measurement and I'm going to go quickly to the other one and check and I'm seeing 1 volt. I was actually seeing 2.01 and I'm seeing 1.02. So it is a good 2 to 1 ratio but as we're able to look at, I'll go to the bigger one, as we're able to look at this waveform separately now, one of the outputs of that tube, yeah, this, what is this? So let's trace this back and the, the distortion is the same on both outputs, which means that if I move to the input, we're probably going to see that too. So as a matter of fact, let me move over to pin two, to the input, and we can see there is the input going into the phase inverter on pin two, and we see the distortion is there as well, right after the coupling capacitor. Okay, let's walk that one back as well. So I'm going to come around the other side of that coupling capacitor to the plate of the 12AX7 just one more step back right and we'll see that the output of the 12AX7 uh, is showing a distorted waveform so let's move to the input of the 12AX7 uh, found on pin 7 here and have a look the input of 12AX7 is looking a lot better than the output huh okay let's let's blow this up uh, look at it at a couple different voltage levels and quite possibly swap out this 12ax7 if necessary see if it follows the tube or something else an entirely different 12ax7 also produces the same pattern there was a resistor down here and I currently have some alligator clips connected down here for some testings I'm doing. There's a, a, a 2700 microfarad resistor that was not able to be checked in circuit. And this tied off of the 4700 microfarad off of the 12AX7. So I checked that one as well. And when I fiddled with some of the uh, resistors, and you can't see it because it's, it's well in the back here behind this capacitor. But when I was fiddling with everything and uh, desoldering and testing and putting everything back together, something very strange happened and I want to show you. Here is the resulting output clamped off of one side of the phase inverter, right? And you'll notice that it is a lot less deformed than it was before. The, the exact same input signal, the exact same parameters, I've got the set level at 100%, nothing has changed except for the fact that I've been playing around uh, having to desolder and resolder uh, the resistors and move some components under the 12AX7. Um, I don't know if this was a physical connection that I've changed. I don't know if the heat had brought about some change to one of the passive components. I'm not quite sure, but what I wanted to further test was uh, number one is obviously uh, voltage readings of pins 6, 7, and 8 on the 12AX7, that first stage. And then perhaps uh, an adjustment of uh, the uh, plate voltage, which right now, um, according to my record, sits at 107K uh, resistance. So it's a 7% high to see if, if, if lowering that might have an effect. And, and possibly uh, an adjustment of the resistance at pin 8 because my records do show that it is showing it off of 5K when it should be 4.7. So there is 
some room for improvement here. What's interesting is this 100K uh, resistor here for the 12AX7, which read 108K, after about 10 minutes of sitting in here was reading 110K. And I generally, uh, you know, uh, check these values when the unit's off. This one was sitting straight across two of the pins. And I'm wondering if there was a uh, mechanical stress from heating up and cooling down over the years that when this thing started to get warm, any amount of heat internally from running, that it was pulling apart and increasing the resistance. I just decided that uh, based on that change alone, uh, 2K resistance, I was going to rip it out, which I did. I've put in a new 100K resistor. It hasn't solved the problem. There's still another one I want to address, but this has already been marked as a problem, so I've removed it, and I'm moving on to the next one. Things got interesting when I attempted to uh, disconnect this coupling capacitor uh, connecting the 12AX7 to the um, 12BY7. And I disconnected one end in order to test this. What happened was, obviously, the output signal of the 12AX7 became unstable. But that really ugly, unstable signal was showing what appeared to be an even sine wave. And, and it got me thinking... First of all, I, I had taken this out and replaced it with a, with another capacitor because I wanted to do some more tests on this that I couldn't fit the uh, device in there because the leg is just so small connected up to it. But what I ended up doing was I ended up removing the 12BY7. And when I did, having disconnected the tube from the circuit, the output from the 12AX7 cleared up perfectly. There's no more distortion on the output at any level. It's perfectly even at both ends. So the problem exists when the 12BY7 is connected in circuit. So now it's time to find out why the 12BY7 is distorting the output signal of the 12AX7. So in the set level mode, the um, tuning circuit here is completely bypassed, comes out of the, um, the uh, phase inverter and goes directly into this 5879. I figured since this already happened to me once, what would happen if I just removed the 5879 from the circuit and see what the output of the 12AX7 looks like, right? From pin six. So I went and did that and I have the phase inverter is in and when I removed the 5879, uh, the signal cleared up just fine. So it's not the phase inverter. I'm glad I didn't spend too much time on that. And now we're going to look here and take a look at this portion of the circuit and see if we can identify the problem down in this section. So I am now through the 5879. And I have found that if I lift the connection between pin 8 on the 5879, the output, and pin two, the uh, grid on the second stage of the very same 12AX7 from which I started, then we have a perfect sine wave. We could see right here, I've, I've zoomed in, uh, absolutely perfect. I'm still reading that uh, same output on pin six way back here. And just by removing that, and if I touch it back together, it'll be uneven again. So now it's time to explore this section of the 12AX7 and see what's going on. This has been quite an adventure of working these signals through this circuit here. As you can see, the sine wave is looking good. Uh, this is in the same test position. I'll explain why it looks the way it does shaking right now. Um, I have found the problem right here. This 47K resistor is acting funky. I have removed it from circuit. This output here from the second stage of 12AX7 uh, feeds back into the circuit. Uh, I've removed it from the circuit and I have this uh, clip holding in another 47k resistor. It's kind of shoddy uh, just for testing which explains why uh, the signal looks the way it does. I'll show you how it looks, how I've installed it temporarily. Right now one end is just held in with an alligator clip and the other end is just stuck in the tube socket. The other side can't be seen. 
it's way behind this capacitor here and it's been disconnected so it's also floating. I have to remove that. I'm gonna permanently affix the new one in there and then we're gonna test everything again. Also, these other resistors that I've put in, I've done so in a, a temporary fashion so they don't get in the way while I'm working. They'll also be put in in a, in a permanent fashion as well. You know, it's just my luck. It just happened to be the very last component in the fundamental suppression circuit that happened to be bad and I worked the whole way through uh, until I found it that that 47k resistor on the feedback circuit now we have this perfect sine wave that that has no distortion on it that makes its way uh, straight through from the input and I have uh, cleaned up everything in here it's now uh, nice and tidy so I will continue going through the rest of the stuff in light of this discovery. All that's left at this point is the voltmeter circuit. And it is, it is not complex. Uh, it is a 12 AT7. A couple of things need to be looked at really quick and that's about it. But yeah, this gremlin was sitting in here. It was uh, eating the signal as, as it would be put into the unit. And I, I just don't know how this was expected to work like that. So that problem is now solved. Well, this is unfortunate. My IG72 has, has up and died on me. It, both of the meters just dropped to zero on the units. And so if I, if I crank it up at, at full tilt, we'll see that it, it tries to get a voltage and you can see it bounces back down. So on the 10 scale, I was getting like, like three volts. So essentially I'm not getting any power out of this thing. So I'm just, you know, I'm wondering what's wrong. We're gonna have to uh, shift projects here to the IG72 and find out why this has died. Get started.